But alhamdulillah we're here and we're here to talk about the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And one of the things the devil promised Allah Jalla fil Ula when he was removed from the hellfire, uh, when he was removed, sorry, and, 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 and was made an enemy of Allah was that that I will come to them in Baini Aidihim wa min khalfihim wa an imanihim wa an shama'ilihim. That I will attack the children of Adam from the front, the back, from every single direction I will attack them. And the culmination of that attack will be wala tajidu aktharahum shakirin. That you will not find the majority of them to be thankful people. And there's a story that they mention, I think it's about Imam al rahimahullah ta'ala, that he would walk, he was walking once, and he walked past a man who said, Allahumma ja'alni min qaleel, oh Allah make me from the few. And when Imam al nawi asked, what do you mean the few? He said, when Allah says in the Quran, wa qaleelun min ibadi shukur very few of my servants are thankful. And it's one of the crises of the modern age that we have become very ungrateful for many of the blessings that Allah Jalla Fil-Ula has given us. And what blessing was greater than the blessing that was the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? When Imam Al-Busir Rahimullah says in the Burda, وَمَنْ هُوَ نِعْمَةُ الْكُبْرَى لِمُعْتَبِرٍ وَمَنْ هُوَ آيَةُ الْكُبْرَى لِمُعْتَبِرٍ وَمَنْ هُوَ نِعْمَةُ الْعُظْمَى لِمُغْتَنِمٍ That he was the greatest sign for the person who would bother to ponder over him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وَمَنْ هُوَ نِعْمَةُ الْعُظْمَى And he was the most magnificent bounty of Allah Jalla fil Ula for those people who recognize the value of the bounties of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so we come here today, inshallah, to be thankful for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And Shaykh Abdul Hakim Murad makes a beautiful point. He says that, say that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he is al-fas. He is the great distinguisher because there are many people on the face of this earth who profess to believe in God. And there are many people who profess to believe in the Day of Judgment and the life after death and angels. But it is only us as believers, as Muslimun, that believe in Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And gatherings where the Prophet ﷺ is mentioned and gatherings in which nothing but the Messenger of Allah ﷺ is mentioned are blessed gatherings. Like the hadith of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ that Ubay ibn Ka'b narrates that he said to the Prophet ﷺ that in my dua I will make my dua one third for you ﷺ, and the rest of it I will make for myself. Like a third of my dua will be salawat and the rest of it will be, will be for, for myself and whatever needs I have. And the Prophet ﷺ said that's good. But more for me is better. And so he said, Ya Rasulullah, I'll do half. Yeah, that's good. But more is better. And then at the end he says, Ya Rasulullah, I will, I will, I will, all my dua will be just salawat upon you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they know then Allah will remove your worries and fulfill every single need that you have. And Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziya, rahimahullah, in Jalal al-Uham says that the reason that Allah will fulfill the, fulfill the needs of somebody who makes the whole gathering just the mention of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that you gave him priority over yourself Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that Allah will give you priority over everybody else. And that's why we sit here today and inshallah we will talk about the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we live in a society, I mean the topic is mentioned is um, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a guide in an age of anxiety. And we live in a society of great anxiety. One of the things, if you, if you ever read on the people who write about the history of civilizations, the likes of Ibn Khaldun, Rahimullah Ta'ala, Imam Maqrizi, even Western historians like Arnold Toynbee and others, they would always talk about civilizations who rise and fall. And one of the things about great civilizations is as they fall, they give it one last throw. You know, you know like a dying animal, a rat, cornered rat. And as it, as it sees that you've got it cornered, it will, it will give it one last throw of the dice. A panicked state that you will fall into, like the sheep that's being slaughtered. And we can see these great anxieties prevalent in the Western civilization that we live in right now. I was reading um, just yesterday, I think, Amelia Clark. Some of you may know that name. The brothers should have no idea who I'm talking about. Anybody who nods their head at Starfield Line should walk out right now. <laughs> Amelia Clark, Daenerys Targaryen from the Game of Thrones series. She wrote this, she was interviewed for the BBC and she said, in, in, for those who have, you know, Game of Thrones, stuff with Allah, but there's a lot of nudity that she had to show in the scenes that she would act in. And she actually says that when I first came onto the show and I would act in those scenes, I would do it 
but I would have like a nervous breakdown every single time. And she goes, I would spend hours in the bathroom crying before I, before I filmed any scene. But I'd come out and I'd just be in tears at what I was being asked to do. She wasn't a Muslim. She wasn't a believer in Allah Jalla Fil'ana. She isn't a Muslim still. But there was an anxiety. Something was wrong with what she was being told to do and she could feel it in the depths of her soul. And we have many examples. We have, and you look at just the, the current state of Western civilization. We have, if anybody watched, the, the debate yesterday between uh, Boris Johnson and the future Prime Minister. Um, we saw clearly that when, when asked about one of the great um, scandals of the modern age is the Jeffrey Epstein, who dies in mysterious circumstances after he's linked to every single famous person and a paedophilia ring and some craziness that's going on there. That's another sign of the, 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 the decrepit attitude that we find within Western civilization. And there's many, many other examples. And the thing about the Western civilization is, over the last hundred years, we've seen this mass secularization that's taken place. Literally, they've, they've attempted to wrench Allah from society, force Him from the souls of people. And they have this idea that as societies develop, people become more and more used to, you know, God will just, they'll get more advanced, we'll give them Netflix or whatever, and they won't need God. Why do you need God if you've got Netflix and, I don't know, Spotify? That will get you through whatever you need. Why do you need anything else? And then suddenly they've got this backlash where people are discovering God when they're not meant to discover God. Kanye West, was it, what's his new album? Kanye, he's got this new album, what's it called? Jesus, Imam <laughs> Ghazali. It's, it's something to do with G. He wrote an album about Jesus. Jesus is king. Jesus is king, that's it, yes. Kanye West's new album, Jesus is king. When interviewed about that, what does he say? He says that for, cent for, for decades the devil tried to take my soul. And only in this moment did I now wake up to the reality of what was happening. There was an article recently in the BBC about Sonny Bill Williams. Our brother, Sonny Bill Williams. who talked about he, he succumbed to the Western lifestyle of drinking and, and gambling and, and womanizing. And he felt destruction happening in his soul until he discovered the truth of Islam. And this is, this is, very, this is very linked to, to, our, to us as believers because we believe in the concept of the fitrah. That the Prophet said, Kullu mawludin yuladu ala al-fitra fa abawahu yuhawwidhanihi wa yumajjisani wa yunasirani. That every single son of Adam is born upon a natural state. That once Allah gathered the whole of humanity and He said to them, Am I not your Lord? And the whole of humanity replied in unison, Qalu bala, of course, Ya Allah, you are our Lord. And, and the soul never forgot its promise. The soul never forgot that promise. And that's why Ibn Taymiyyah makes mention of one of the most... One, it's an example that really touches my soul every time I read it. He says that the example of the dhikr of Allah and the believer is like a fish in water. What? And he says, he says, what happens to the fish when you take it out of water? It begins to panic. He wants to go home. It's an anxiety. Ibn Qayyim al jawziya for those who study politics, you've heard of Karl Marx, right? He has this concept, what is it? Alienation. The workers are split. They're not allowed to reach the means of production. So now they're really upset about that. And Ibn Qayyim al jawziya he says, real wilderness, to be lost, al-wahsha al-asliya is wahsha min Allah. To be lost is to be lost from Allah. When Allah is removed from your purview, you can't even see your God anymore. That's why when the Prophet sallallahu said, mudmin al-mudmin al-khamri ka'abidi wathan, the one addicted to alcohol is like the idol worshiper. And they say, why? Is because he can no longer recognize the existence of his Lord. When you're in a state of intoxication, your recognition of your Lord is gone. It's a destruction of the state of it. And that's why when the Messenger of Allah went on the Mi'raj, what was offered to him? Milk and wine. And the Prophet looked to Jibreel and Jibreel, and, and he took the milk. And the, and the Jibreel said, that's the way of the fitrah. Your ummah will remain on the way of the fitrah because you chose the way of the fitrah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if we go back to the story of Adam alayhi salam, I, there's actually a statement I want to say first. There's a very beautiful quote that I heard recently that, that I found very powerful. It's, it's by a British author by, called Julian Barnes, and he says, I don't believe in God. He's an atheist. He says, I don't believe in God, but I sure do miss him. I don't believe in him, but I miss him. Because they, rec they recognize that there's something missing. And that's why people are looking for outlets in every single opportunity that they can find to fulfill the hole in their hearts. 
And some of them do it through material means. And the Prophet ﷺ spoke about that. That the son of Adam, you'll give him to a valley full of gold, he'll never be happy. He'll ask for a second and you give him a second and he won't be happy. And nothing will fill the cavity, Jawfu ibn Adam illa turab, except the dust of the grave. And so when we come to the, the story of humanity itself, we start, we say, Na Adam alayhi salatu was salam. And one of the things, civilization, that was the, the birth of civilization. And it grew until the time of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But with Adam alayhi salam, Allah says to him in Surah Al-Baqarah, فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدًا فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَايَ فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهُمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ That when the guidance will guide will perpetually throughout human history now, guidance will come from me. And your, your children now, your descendants will have to catch on to that guidance every time it comes. And whosoever follows that guidance, they will have no fear upon them and they'll have no depression or anxiety to worry about. And the prophets came one by one until we came to Isa alayhi salatu was salam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said about Isa alayhi salam, Ana awla bi Isa ibn Maryam. I am the closest of all prophets to Isa, the son of Mary. Because there is no prophet between me and him. And all the prophets are like, they're like brothers. Their father is the same, but their mothers are different. That's what the Prophet said about Deenuhum Wahid, their religion is one. And that's why Isa alayhi salam, as mentioned in the Bible, when they came to him and they said, Are you John the Baptist? And he said, No. Are you Elijah? He says, No. Are you that prophet? And he says, I'm not that prophet. And then as he's leaving, according to them, as he's leaving the dunya, he says to the to the disciples, he says, I'm going now. And I haven't had the chance to tell you what I needed to tell you, but the paraclete will come. And he will tell you. He will speak to you and he will teach you. And paraclete either means the intercessor, which is the Ashafi, sallallahu alayhi wa or in another version it could actually mean the one who is praised or not, which is literally Muhammad. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so then after the, 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 the moving, after the raising of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, we come to the story of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is chosen for a people, the Arabs. And who are the Arabs? A bunch of nomadic quote unquote barbarians. But they're not barbarians. The Prophet Sallallahu was chosen for the Arabs because there was something special that Allah saw in them. Because they were the people of the fitrah. They'd never been diluted. No king had ever managed to rule over them. No civilization had managed to, to, to take its hooks and snare them. No one had managed to grip them. They were free people. They loved their freedom. They didn't do great things. They used to drink and they didn't do much with their freedom. But they were free people. And Allah knew that if I managed to get these people to believe, they will carry the message in a way that nobody, nobody throughout human history has been able to carry the message of Islam. And like, like Sayyidina Ja'far radiallahu anhu said to the Najashi when he was there, he says, Kunna qawman jahili. We were people of ignorance. Na'til fawahish wa na'kulul mayta. We used to eat dead meat and we used to go and do uh, the horrible vulgarities, fornication, whatever. We used to do all these horrible things. Hatta ba'atha ilayna. Hatta ba'atha Allahu ilayna rasoolan minna. Until Allah sent us a messenger from amongst us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam changed everything for them. Because they were in the light, the darkness of jahiliyyah. You know, Sayyid Qutub rahimullah, speaks about the jahiliyyah, that this modern state of the material jahiliyyah, the secular jahiliyyah we live in today. But he speaks, that was the jahiliyyah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, coming before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what does Sayyidina Anas say? If the Prophet Allah says in the Quran, يُخْرِجُكُم مِّنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ Allah took you out from the darknesses. Not darkness, darknesses, layer upon layer upon layer of darkness. And he brought you to the light. And Sayyidina Anas radiallahu anhu said that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to Medina, it was as if Medina lit up. The Prophet ﷺ lit the world up with his arrival. And Sayyidina Anas said when he left, it was as if everything fell into darkness. And in the same way that they needed the light to take them out of the darkness, we live in the very dark times right now. It's, it's, sometimes it's very hard to see because we live in affluence and things are great, it seems, because we're eating and everything. But there's a great dark secular materialistic civilization or darkness that's above us. And the only light that can take us out is the light of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there's no doubt denying that. That's why Imam al-Sa'adi says that he, the light of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is beautiful. Because he says, um, Ya sahib al-jamal, ya sayyid al-bashar, min wajhi kal munir qad nuwir al-qamar. He says that, O oh, 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 person of beauty, O oh, companion of beauty, O oh, leader of humanity, 
from the beauty, from the light of your face was the moon lit up. The Sahabi used to say the night his face used to shine like the moon on the night of Badr. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so what I wanted to share with you today, and this was just like an interlude, or not an interlude, it was the prelude, <coughs> is the hadith of Hiraqal. And some of you may have heard this hadith before, but this is the hadith of the Byzantine emperor of Rome. Not Rome, Constantinople. Because there's, if you know the history of the Roman Empire, I don't want to get into like a history lesson, but yeah, the Roman Empire, Barbarians come, everything, they sort of, it splits into two. So you have the Western Roman Empire, that's Julius Caesar and all that, Colosseums and gladiators. Then you have the Eastern Roman Empire, that's Constantine, that's the one the Ottomans took. Alhamdulillah. So what happens is, um, he's the Byzantine emperor at the coming of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he's an expert on the Christian tradition. And... It's very famous what happens with him, and I don't want to get into detail, but there's a surah in the Quran, surah al-Rum, the story of the surah of the Romans. And it's a very famous, he has a massive war with the Persians. And the Quran predicts his victory, and there's a long story behind that. And as he wins the war against the Persians, that Allah gives him the victory, and Allah predicted his victory. Then he sort of comes back, he does a pilgrimage on foot, and they, they, they lost so much territory, they lost Palestine, they lost the cross, and they got everything back. And now he's sat in his palace and he's heard the news of a man in Arabia claiming to be the messenger of God And so what he does is he needs to find out more about this claimant to prophethood. And so he sends, uh, he, sends uh, envo- he sends spies or envoys to find any Arabs they can in his empire so he can interrogate them about the messenger of Allah the hadith in Sahih Bukhari, you can read the hadith in full. We're going to go through parts of it, I think. I don't know if we'll have time to get through all of it. I've taken up quite a bit of time already. Um, this hadith narrated by Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the cousin of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When, Abu, uh, when uh, Heraclius sends, for, he needs to find somebody to tell him about the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Bad luck to the Muslims, the person he finds is Abu Sufyan. At that time, Abu Sufyan, after the death of Abu Jahl, is the new supreme leader of the polytheists of Mecca. He's the unanimous leader now. He's taken over. And at this time, for those who know Sirah, this is at the time of the Sulh Hudaybiyyah, the treaty between the Arabs, between the Muslims, sorry, and the Mushrikeen. For 10 years, they will not fight one another. And all these conditions are placed on the Muslims, and it's a long story, and you should all read Sirah. I don't know if we're, are we still in the month of Rabi al-Awwal? I think we're coming to the close of the month of Rabi al-Awwal. Whether you believe, whatever you believe about the month of Rabi, it was definitely, it's definitely a month in which you should take time out to gain closeness to the Messenger of Allah. So like every month is a month to gain closeness. And if you need any excuse to read Sirah, maybe this will be the excuse you need. But reading the Sirah of the Prophet is something every believer should have a very close attachment to. And so what happens is, Abu Sufyan narrates. Abu Sufyan becomes Muslim later on. And he gives great sacrifices for Islam. He loses his eye in the Battle of Yarmouk. So he becomes a very powerful Sahabi of the Prophet But for now he's a disbeliever. And he's not just any disbeliever, he's the ultimate opponent of the Messenger of Allah He says that Heraclius sent for a caravan of the Quraysh. There were about 30 of them, they went to do trade in the Levant region. Heraclius found out, Heracl or Heraclius, however you want to say it. And he manages to grab them. And he says, it was at a time that we were in truce with the Prophet and we were, they were in a place called Elia in, uh, in Sham. And he said that we were brought to the gathering of the Byzantine Emperor. And around him, he had all the dignitaries of the Byzantine Empire. The super, in, in that time, that was the world power. There were two world powers, the Sassanid Empire and the Byzantine. This is a massive, this is the, the, the most powerful leader in the world that Abu Sufyan has been presented in front of. And he goes that there was a translator. And the first thing Heraclius asked is, who from amongst you is closest in lineage to this man? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yaz'amu annahu nabi, who thinks that he's a prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then Abu Sufyan said, I am the closest to him in lineage. Because he was related to the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was his second cousin or something. Or actually first cousin maybe even. Right? Because of Banu Abdul Manaf, it's whatever. 
It's a lineage thing. You have to go into it. It's very detailed. But then he comes and he says, bring him close to me. And bring his companions as well. And then he says, make him stand in front of his companions and make his companions stand behind him. And the reason he does that is because he knows that if Abu Sufyan lies, then the people behind him will take any opportunity to say he's a liar. Do you know, like he'd have that guilt thing, that he'd go back to Mecca and they'll say, oh, you know Abu Sufyan, he got called by the Byzantine emperor. And he asked him about the Prophet Sallallahu and he lied. Because the Arabs had that dignity amongst them. They still had that sense of morality that you can't lie. Lying, that's, that's a no-go. You can't say anything. That's untrue. And it will be held against them. Because they had a shame culture. You know, like that thing, what would the neighbors think? Yeah? I don't know if you're in Pakistan, you see, but that's a massive Pakistan. I think everybody's got it. Asian, yeah, it's Middle Eastern. That, what would the neighbors think? Right? That's the thing that they had. That if I do anything or say anything, then I come, the word comes back to me, what will the people say about Abu Sufyan? He's a liar. And so what happens is that Abu Sufyan goes in front of Heraclius. And then Heraclius says, I'm going to ask you, and he says a beautiful thing, he says, An had a rajul. I'm going to ask you about that rajul. My teacher, Shaykh Yusuf Mutara, rahmatullah alayhi, who passed away in the month of Muharram, may Allah have mercy on him. Um, he used to always tell us a story. It's a little digression, but I love it so much that I'd love to share this with you. He used to say to us that when the angels come to you in the grave, they're going to ask you, Man had a rajul. So who is the rajul? Who is this Rajul? They're not going to name the Prophet And he says, your connection to the Prophet has to be so strong just by the mere statement, who is the man? Or who is this man? The first thing that should come to your head is the Messenger of Allah Just by the, the man. The ultimate man. And he used to say a statement that when the Dajjal would come to Medina, when he will come to Medina and he will not be able to enter Medina, the statement he will make at that moment will be, Hadihi Baldat Rajul. This is the town of the Rajul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he would always say, Rahimullah ta'ala, that what is our state that the Dajjal has recognized the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we have it. And it's a very powerful statement. And so, and the Rajul, this is another point, if we start with the idea of the modernity, the problem of modernity, one of the great anxieties of modernity is the fact that we have no Rijal left. The, the crisis of modern masculinity, they call it. And trust me, it's not, I'm not making this up, this is a big problem. Men have become weak. This is actual scientific thing that testosterone levels have dropped consistently over the last hundred years. Men are not being, the men are just not men anymore. Men don't take responsibility for their lives. Men don't want to get married. In its Muslim communities, it's a big problem. Men don't want to get married. Men don't want to step up to the plate. Men don't want to work. They're too fixated. I want to play football. Football manager, season 18 or something. <laughs> I've been going strong. Some of you are smiling and stuff. But that's, you know, and they play video games. Fortnite, and I don't know, there's some new ones now and stuff, and now virtuality and stadia and all this other stuff. And they're just so fixated on all these things that we just, we, there's a massive loss. There's a massive crisis, the crisis of modern masculinity that is lost. And many, many great psychologists of the modern age are speaking about this problem. That what do we do now to bring our men back to what they used to be? The Rijal of the Sahaba were not like that. When Zubair ibn Awam, when he was a young man, he used to be a young man, his mother was Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib. She used, to, she, used to, she, she used to beat the living daylights out of him. She used to train him to be a warrior. And as she was training him, if he ever missed the arrow, she would really lay. And she was so intense that even in the intense atmosphere of Quraysh, they came and complained and said, Sophia, you need to relax. You're going too far. Well, the guy's got a heart. You need to have a heart. And she said, my son will be a leader from in the armies of Quraysh. And he would, he, would, he would lead the flank, on the right flank of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa Zubair bin Awam. Abdullah bin Zubair, his son would say that when I was a child, I would play with the wounds in the chest of my father. Rijal. The Rijal of the Sahaba Ridwanullah Ta'ala alayhi majma'in. And that's one of the great problems that we face in the age. And so then after that, he comes and then he calls him and then he starts asking him questions. And Abu Sufyan says, if it wasn't the, the shame that they would call me a liar, I would have lied about the Prophet. I would have said anything and everything, but I knew those 29 guys behind me. You know, like they're your friends, but they're not really your friends. You know, like, you know, they're like, ah, oh, yeah, but you know, as soon as they go back, they're just going to stab you. Oh, this is funny, a liar, because they love to gossip or whatever. So he knew everything I say will be recorded here. And so he comes, and then, he, and then 
The first question he asks is, uh, how is his lineage from amongst you, sallallahu alayhi wa And Abu Sufyan says that he is a nasab, that he's a person of strong lineage. Like Habib Umar in the Diyar al it says, Khiyar ibn Khiyar ibn Khiyar. He's, he's a chosen one from the son of the two chosen one, son of the chosen one. His lineage is all amazing people. The Prophet sallallahu lineage is all selected, hand selected by Allah Jalla fil Ula. Like he said, the best are the, you know, the best are the Arabs and the best from the Arabs are the Quraysh and the best from the Quraysh are the Banu Hashim and the best from Banu Hashim is Ana. Ana Sayyidu Walda Adam, la fakhra fi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That I am the leader of the children of Adam, but I have no boasting in when I say that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he asked him, he said, did anybody say this before him? Like, was this, you know, this whole claim of prophethood? Did anybody say this before him? And Abu Sufyan, and Abu Sufyan's answering these questions, Heraclius is going to give an analysis at the end. You like much of the analysis? He's just waiting for all the answers, and he's going to analyze them at the end. And you're going to hear his analysis. And he says, La, nobody said this before him. And so he says, and then, here's, and then he says, and this is a very powerful question. He says, were any of his forefathers kings? And he says, no, that none of his forefathers were kings. And the thing is, the Prophet ﷺ, for the Arabs, the statement that the Prophet ﷺ was the first from amongst them to claim prophethood is true. The Arabs never had a prophet before the Prophet ﷺ. And that's why when he passed away, Sayyidina Anas bin Malik anhu actually says, we didn't even know where to bury him. Because we never had a prophet before. He was our only prophet ﷺ. Which is heartbreaking to hear even as a statement. They didn't know what to, and that's why, you know, Sayyidah Fatima comes and says, how, do, how could you bear it to throw dust on the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? They didn't know where to bury him. Sayyidah Bakr had to come and say that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the Prophet is buried where he passes away. And so they didn't even know, because he was their first Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's why when the Jews of Medina, they used to have this big claim, because they thought the Prophet was going to be from amongst them. And so they used to actually, when they were in Medina, they were, and the tribes of the Arabs were there, the Aus and the Khazraj, they used to say to the Aus and the Khazraj, you, you guys getting the big up on us now, but until the last prophet comes, and you guys are going to find out. Literally, that was their big statement. When the last prophet comes, you guys are screwed. It's over. Khalas, game over. And when the last prophet came, the Aus and the Khazars believed in him, and they didn't. And then the Jews got exiled, but that's another story for another time. <laughs> and so, then they asked, are any from amongst them, were any of his forefathers kings? And he says, no, that none of his forefathers were kings. And this is from the great humility of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was the leader of Arabia, but he was like a person from amongst them. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ جَلَسَ حِينَ مَا يَنْتَهِ الْمَجْلِسِ He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Shema'il is mentioned, he would sit wherever the gathering finished. Like when he'd walk into a gathering, he would sit where he'd find Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he would find space, he'd just sit down. Like you have guys who I need an entourage and I need a red carpet and I need grapes and nuts and I need this and that. But he Sallallahu would walk in and he'd just sit wherever he wanted, wherever there was space. Never expecting. People would, the, the Bedouins would walk into the gathering of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the first question, Hey you come Muhammad! Like because they were like rough people but the first, who is Muhammad? Why don't you use Muhammad? Who, who is it? You know like a, you know like Tyson Fury star, gypsy type, you know like that. Hey you come Muhammad! Which one of you is Muhammad? And then the Prophet, I know Muhammad. And then they say, oh, I heard you said, if I believe in Allah and I pray and I fast and I do hajj and I do zakah, I'll get to paradise. I did. Okay, that's what I'm going to do, Khudafis. Literally, that's what they do. <laughs> that's what they do. That's the way. But they were like, really? But he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they wouldn't even know which one was the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Until the Sahaba later had to build a little support, a little area, so they could tell that this was the Prophet, because it was getting a bit too ridiculous. <laughs> like, wufu, the tribes would come and they wouldn't know. When the Prophet entered Medina, they thought Abu Bakr was the Prophet. So, yeah, the Prophet Sayyidina Anas says that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, anybody would invite him to their house, he would go. He goes, we were invited once for a meal, stale bread and fat. Stale bread and fat. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went and he ate, and he didn't come back. Aina muluk al Look at the kings of today. Look at the leaders of today. They say about the Prophet, the famous statement of the Prophet Amirul Qawmi Khadimuhum, the leader of a people is their servant. And the Prophet Sallallahu when they built, the, when they dug the Khandaq, he dug with them. When they built the Masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu he built it with them. When they would sing as they were building the Masjid, Alawla Allah, you know, Ma Sallayna, Wa La Tusaddaqna, and they're singing, you know, Wa Anzul As-Sakinata Alayna, the Prophet Sallallahu would sing along with them. 
يا لزنت اللهم لا عيش إلا عيش الآخرة فالحمير الأنصار والمحاجرة that oh Allah there is no life except the life of the hereafter oh Allah have mercy upon the Ansar and Muhajirin Ameen and that's what the Prophet said he would be with them in every single thing that they would do when they tied the stone to the stomach he tied two stones to his stomach Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when Adi ibn Hatim radiallahu ta'ala anhu he was a Christian from outside Medina to Munawwara after the Muslims um, of near the end of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he came to Medina Munawwara to meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he comes to meet the Prophet ﷺ, he goes, I came, I was a king from my people. I knew what kings were. I knew what it meant to be a king. And so I expected, I came to Medina expecting that I would meet the king of Medina. And as I walked in, and I, I, I met the Prophet ﷺ, and he walked me to his house. They walked together to the house of the Prophet ﷺ. And he goes, I was walking with the Prophet ﷺ, then suddenly a woman came out of nowhere and she said, Ya Rasulullah, I have a hajj, I have a need. I need to speak to you about something. And Adi ibn Hatim said, the Prophet ﷺ took that woman and he stood in the service of that woman for so long. He wasn't a Muslim because he stood for the service of that woman for so long that I believed he was the messenger of Allah Because there was no way a normal king would stand for the service of a woman for so long. And he goes, at that point I recognized that بَيْنَ الْمُلُوكِيَ وَالنُّبُوَّةِ that there was a difference between monarchy, kingship, leadership, democracy. Vote for me. I'm the best person for the job. You got, you know, I'm. It's me. In Islam, what do we believe? That the Prophet ﷺ said, the person who who puts himself forward for the task, Allah will leave him to the task, and whosoever is put forward, Allah will help him. In Islam, the, the guy who's saying vote for me, that's the sign you shouldn't be voting for him. And that's why Jeremy Corbyn does say there is a statement. I read this recently. I don't know if you saw it. I put it up as well where he said that this was, the leadership was something, that's something that should be forced on people. You shouldn't, you shouldn't ask for leadership. I'm the best man for the job, he's assigned you the worst man for the job. And so the Prophet wasallam, that was the day, he wasn't a king. He wasn't reclaiming a throne. And so he goes on and then he asks, who follows him? He goes to the, the noble people. And he doesn't mean here the noble, what he means is the aristocratic elite. Is it the aristocrats? Is it the rich? Is it the few? <laughs> I follow the, yeah. I don't know. Am I a representative of Karima here? Or am I my own individual identity? I'm myself. Yeah, then is it the few? Is it the vested interests? Is it, what is it? Big pollution. <laughs> that control. Who's, who follows the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Ashrafuhum am du'afa'uhum. Is it the strong or the weak? And it is known about the prophets alayhi wa salatu wa salam. In summary, is the, the majority of the followers of prophets would be the youth of their locality. Which is why it's very scary to see the youth of the Muslims falling away. Because it was always the youth of a community would be the first. When Abu Hurairah عنه, was sitting once with the youth of Medina Munawwara, and a man walked past and he goes, look at Abu Hurairah sitting with children. He says, you know, are, are the shabab of the ummah not the honor of the ummah? Aren't the people, aren't you guys the honor of the ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And was it, the, is it the honorable people, was it the vested interest that would follow the Prophet wasallam, Or was it the weak people that would follow the Messenger of Allah wasallam? The, 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 the powerful had everything to lose with the message of the Prophet wasallam. It was always the slaves of Makkah al-Mukarramah, the Bilal and the Suhaib al-Rumi and um, Salman al-Farisi and the weak and disenfranchised who would go run to the Prophet wasallam. And the Prophet ﷺ would do everything to elevate people in the society. The modernity, modernity, a system that always elevates those who are already elevated in the eyes of material. Whereas the Prophet ﷺ, he would always, when the man, there was a man, a Bedouin, who came to see the Prophet ﷺ, he was very close to the Prophet ﷺ, and it was Zahir. He was a Bedouin, he used to come to Medina to sell stuff. He used to always bring gifts for the Prophet ﷺ from the marketplace. But he was a Bedouin. And people didn't really like the Bedouin. You know, like you know, like a gypsy. You know, like the gypsies, right? You know, you get a lot of anti. You know, Tyson Fury came out recently and goes, "I not I had to deal with a lot of anti-gypsy bias when I was boxing." Like that, there was a lot of uh, discrimination that would take place against them. And so what happened was, he comes to uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he used to be in the in the market of Medina to Munawwara. This Bedouin, his name was Zahir. He's mentioned in the Shamail of Imam Tirmidhi, and he would come and he would sell in the market of Medina to Munawwara. And he's there and he's shouting, you know, whatever, oh, buy my turnips or whatever. And, he's, and, and, the, and, and then the Prophet walks behind him 
and he, and he sort of covers his eyes, or he hugs him from behind, you know, like, he gets him into like a bear hug, really naked show, and whatever. And then, then, no, nobody gets that reference. Okay. <laughs> and then, so what happened was, um, Zahir's like, oh, who, who is it? get off me, what do you think you're doing, huh? And then he sees, he turns, and he could smell the Prophet on the line itself. Because could, they say that we would walk past the streets, and we know the Prophet had walked in the streets because he could smell the Prophet. It must. Um Sulaim used to collect his sweat when he used to sleep in her house for her perfume. And once the Prophet started to woke up while she was collecting it, <laughs> said, Um Sulaim, what are you doing? <laughs> and she goes, We put it in our perfume, we saw the last light. And he said, It's okay. And so Zahid, he suddenly realized it was the Prophet, and he starts rubbing himself on the Prophet. And then the Prophet said, May you study had al Abd? Who will buy this slave? And then he says, Ya Rasulullah, you know, Wajatani Kasidan. You're, I'm cheap, no one's going to want to buy me. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Lasta bi kasibin amdallah, you're not cheap in the eyes of Allah. That's a ghalim. You're expensive in the eyes of Allah. You mean something to Allah Jalla fil ula. Anybody who was weak and disenfranchised, the Prophet ﷺ raised them. There were people, you know, you would tell was a disability awareness or something? In, include, I don't know. Disability something. And what happened was, the Prophet ﷺ, who was the Mu'addin of the Prophet ﷺ in Medina Munawwar? One of the Mu'addin. Bilal, everybody knows Bilal. Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, the blind companion of the Prophet ﷺ, who used to give the adhan in the city of the Prophet ﷺ. And when the Prophet ﷺ would go on campaigns, he would tell Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, you are my subordinate in Medina to Munawwar. You watch over the people of Medina Munawwar while I'm gone. And the famous story that once the Prophet ﷺ was sitting with the Ashraf of Mecca and he's trying to convince them of Islam and Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum came, the blind man, the famous story of the blind man and the Prophet ﷺ told, you know, he may just made a face that maybe now is not the time. And Allah revealed verses telling the Prophet ﷺ, and every time the Prophet ﷺ would see him, the Prophet ﷺ would say, you know, peace be upon the one because of whom Allah told me off. The blind companion of the Prophet ﷺ. Ideas, we have this problem, racism and all these things. The woman who would sweep, sweep the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ was a black woman. The Prophet ﷺ, one of the amazing things about him, when people, when he would realize, when people weren't there, he'd realize. And he'd always ask, where's so-and-so gone? Have you, I haven't seen that person so much. And, so, I haven't seen, and, and his companions carried on this habit, saying, Umar, and tell the story about Sayyidina Umar. He found out there was a man who used to attend the masjid. He didn't come one day. The boy said, Umar said, where's he gone? And so they said, oh, we don't know. So Sayyidina Umar went to his house and goes, where were you for Fajr? He says, oh, I prayed the Hajjid all night. I couldn't wake up. <laughs> we maybe have other excuses. <laughs> Inshallah, we have no excuses. We pray our Fajr. But then the Prophet ﷺ noticed the blind, the black woman who had sweeped the masjid hadn't come for so long. And he said, what happened to her? They said, yes, well, she passed away in the night. And we didn't want to disturb you because it was night time. And the Prophet got upset. And he said, you should have told me I would have prayed her janana. And he said, take me to her grave so I can pray over her. Radiallahu ta'ala anha. He was always, this is, Islam is the disenfranchisement of the weak. It's the only system by which you can do it. And then he said, after, are, are, the, are the Muslims increasing in number or are they decreasing in number? And he says, they're increasing. And then he asks, do any of them apostate from the faith for hatred of the religion after having entered it? And Abu Sufyan said, no. Nobody enters Islam except they stay in Islam. And I'm going to come back to this because there's, in Heraclius' reply, there's a beautiful thing. But at this point, we just make mention of the fact that this crisis that we have of apostasy is a very big problem in the Muslim community. I think it's a 50% pure research said, at least in America, America, everything's bad in America. But then he says that in America, they have 50%, I think it is, or 25% of Muslims leave the faith. That's just it. That's the blanket statistic. It's not oh, of certain types of Muslims. They have a massive problem. The ex-Muslim phenomenon that has come out. But Allah says in the Quran, Ya ladina amanu min yartadda minkum an dini fa sawfa yati Allah biqawmi yuhibbuhum wa yuhibboon Oh, you who believe, whosoever from you apostates from the deen, know that Allah will bring another people. You can leave. We don't want them to leave. And, and as long as they haven't left, we will do everything in our power to make sure they don't leave. That's a fact. That's what every believer should do. Answer their doubts. Treat them with love and respect. 
But once you leave and you attack Islam, at that point, khalas. Then know that Allah will bring another people. There are people coming into Islam who love Islam. Allah love them and they love Allah. And what more do you need apart from the love of Allah? And so he says that nobody leaves the faith. And then he says, did you ever accuse him of, of, of lying before he came and said what he said? And he said, no. He was, that I don't even have to, Sadiq al-Amin, sallallahu he, he was a prophet and they were at war with him and they would still, they would still leave their belongings with him for trust, for safekeeping, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned them of something, they knew it was going to, you know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sometimes, you know when he made bad dua on them, when they attacked him and he said, they were so terrified after that. Because they knew the Prophet ﷺ would never. And that's why we know that the, the, the mushrikeen knew that the Prophet ﷺ was a prophet. Once Abu Jahl was sitting with one of his companions and the companion said, Ya Abu Jahl, just me and you, man. Well, it wasn't just me and him, was it? Because we know <laughs> that happened. <laughs> but to him, he said, it's just me and you. There's no one else here. Muhammad, what do you think? What's the, what's the sketch? He says, I'll tell you the truth. He's not lying. It's true. He's a prophet. But Banu Hashim, they took the Hajj, <laughs> they took the Zamzam, <laughs> they took trade, they took everything. What are you going to give them that prophethood? <laughs> nah, we can't give them that. They used to say that, but Abu Jahl and uh, the leaders of the Mushrikeen, they used to sneak to the house of the Prophet ﷺ at night in Makkah Mukarramah to hear him recite the Quran. <laughs> and the problem was they bumped into each other once, <laughs> three of them. <laughs> so where are you going? Ah, oh, just uh, three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Walk <laughs> and you say, Nah, where are you going? Where are you going? Oh, I went to Muhammad. Were you there as well? I was there as well. I was hiding on the other side. <laughs> what about you? What were you doing? Oh, I was there. Oh, okay. okay, never again. Never again. <laughs> Next day they bumped into each other again. <laughs> so I learned to, never, never, never. Third day they're like, Okay, now if the youth, this is the point. They said, If the youth of Makkah find out, they leave. They leave our faith and they'll join Islam. And after that, they never went back. But they knew he was the messenger of Allah. Sallallahu they knew. And it was, it was everything but Islam that stopped them from entering it. Political allegiances, tribal affiliations, whatever other reasons, people have psychological reasons. And then they says, he says to him, this is, he says, has he ever, ever betrayed you? Like, have you ever had a trust with him and he betrayed the trust? Have like, you made an agreement with him? Has the Prophet ﷺ ever broken a trust? And Abu Sufyan says, no. And this is his chance now. He says, I waited for every opportunity to say something bad about the Prophet ﷺ, but I couldn't find a chance. And he goes, finally I found the chance. This was it. And I said, at the moment we're in a truce and I don't know what he's going to do. <laughs> that was lit. He waited, he said, I was waiting for the opportunity and suddenly it came and that was all I could say was, oh, we're in a truce at the moment, things are going well. And the funny thing is Abu Sufyan breaks the truce. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the Prophet them. They backed the Banu Khuza'ah in the, in the, against the Banu Bakr and they broke the truce between them. And then the Prophet them went and conquered Makkah. <laughs> but he said, I waited for every opportunity to say something I couldn't think. And then suddenly when he asked, has he ever betrayed you? I said, well, he might. <laughs> I don't know yet. We have to wait and see. And we did wait and see. <laughs> and it was Abu Sufyan that broke the truce. And then he asked, and this is very powerful for us in the modern age as well, that... Do you, have you had wars with him? Have you fought with the Prophet ﷺ? And he said, I said yes. And Heraclius asks, how were your conflicts with the Messenger of Allah ﷺ? And he says, الْحَرْبُ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَهُ السِّجَالِ يَنَالُ مِنَّا وَنَنَالُ مِنْهُ It's, you know like uh, in the Quran, تِلْكَ الْأَيَّامُ نُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ He says, how are the wars between you and the Muslims? And he says, the wars between us, some here, some with there. Back and forth. We win some, they take some. Like Allah says in the Quran, these are the days we give some to them, we give some to you. Amanu. So Allah can find out who really believes. And that's the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ losing battles. Because if the Prophet ﷺ won every single battle, then what would have been the honor on following the Prophet ﷺ? Because you could be like, I follow the Prophet ﷺ, can he win battles? And we get loads of money and, and loads of gold and stuff like that. So Allah wants to see, look, he's going to lose a battle. Let's see if you still stick around. When the going gets tough, what do you do then? When things are good, anybody can stick around. And sometimes when the going is good, people still don't stick around. Like Ibn Qayyim al rahimullah mentions one of the most beautiful statements I read from him. He says in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, تَعَرَّفَ اللَّهُ فِي الرِّخَاءِ 
Arrafak Allah fi shidda that recognize Allah in the good times, Allah will recognize you in the hard times. And he mentions a statement, right? He says a statement when he explains that, he says, because when it's the good times, Allah sort of escapes your mind. And you start you start associating all the goodness with everything but Allah. It's the markets. It's I don't know, my parents. It's me. I revise and I smash this degree and you know, I achieved everything. And you forget that it was Allah. And he says that when you call on Allah in the good times, it's so that your voice becomes recognized in the heavens. And then the angels say to Allah, هَذَا صَوْتٌ مَعْرُوفٌ مِنْ عَبْدٍ مَعْرُوفٌ You know, they recognize the voice. And so when the hard time comes and then you call on Allah, or like Rumi says, Allah restricts things on you so you cry to Him. And so you raise your hands and you call to Allah in the hard times, Allah recognizes your voice. There's, it's Him again. He used to call on us in the good times and now He's in hard times and so let's help Him. And He says, those people that don't call on Allah in the good times, when the voice comes, they say, Ah, هَذَا صَوْتٌ مُنْكَرٌ مِنْ عَبْدٍ This is a, we don't know who this is. And I've been told I have 15 minutes left. Yeah, I'm sorry for stitching you. <laughs> so, oh. I don't know, 15, I don't know, I'm not going to be able to do it in 15. Can I go a bit over with that? Or is, that is that like a, is that like a tight, is that tight timing? No? It's fine. It's fine, carry on? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so did democracy vote? No? Okay. So then he says, and this is one of the things about um, the hardship. Because sometimes you make alliances with people and when the hard time comes, they'll leave you standing. And the most greatest alliance, that, uh, the greatest betrayer of alliances is the devil himself. And that's why Allah, when, talk, when He talks about him in the Qur'an, وَإِذْ زَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ وَعَمَالَهُمْ وَقَالَ لَا غَالِبَ لَكُمُ الْيَوْمَ مِنَ النَّاسِ وَإِنِّي جَارٌ لَكُمْ Abadr, he came. The devil used to come to the mushrikeen of Mecca in the guise of an old Najdi man. Take that to be what you wish. <laughs> and so the devil used to come, and he used to come to the mushrikeen, and he came at Badr. And when he came up other, he said, he said to the mushrikeen on that day, لا غالب لكم اليوم من الناس وإني جار لكم Nobody's going to beat you today. I'm with you as well. Look me. I'm shaitan. فلما ترأت الفئتان نقص على نقص على عقبي. And when the going got tough and the two armies met, the devil ran on his heels. وقال إني بريء منكم إني أرى ما لا ترون إني أخاف الله. He says what? He says, I've got nothing to do with you. When suddenly the going got tough, the devil's first claim is, well, I have nothing to do. I don't know who you are. What are you on about? And he says, what does he say? He says, I can see things you can't see. And then he says, In the, I fear Allah. Suddenly now he's discovered the fear of Allah. When Badr is happening and he's about to lose, he's like, I've suddenly discovered the fear of Allah. Wallahu shadeed al And that's why you have to be very careful. And that's why on the day of judgment, he'll come again and well, we won't go there. But then what happens is, he says then to him, what does the Prophet ﷺ command you to? Now remember, Abu Sufyan is now going to, Abu Sufyan is going to tell us what Islam means. An enemy of Islam at that time. And he says, he says to worship Allah alone. That only Allah gets to define existence for us. That morality and everything that is good and bad are only decided by Allah. That our faith is tied to Allah alone and nobody else. You know, Nietzsche spoke about, um, he has a famous statement, if you guys have ever read Nietzsche, he says, God is dead. And what have we done? We've killed him. And now we have to become gods ourselves. And that's the nature of the modern age, because God's not there anymore, so now you have to step up to the plate and make it up as you go along, your own religions and your own identities. And what does the, Abu Sufyan say? That worship Allah alone, and do not not associate partners with him. Islam is perfection in and of itself. You do not need to distort your Islam to fulfill the criterion that modernity places on it. it Shaykh Abdul Hakim Allah says a beautiful statement. He goes, if modernity doesn't like Islam, then we are happy with that. Because why would we want an Islam that the materialists and the, 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 the hedonists and the egotistical and the elitists, how, how can we have a religion that they love? Isn't our religion by, by its definition something that modernity should despise if modernity is the religion of the devil? Do not associate part. Do not, do not, do not play with your religion to, to, to satiate people that do not care about you. And then he says, 
and leave that which your forefathers have told you. These tribal affiliations. We have a big problem in High Wycombe, I don't know about Birmingham, Braderies. Yes, I don't know. Nobody, no, nobody's nodding. It's just you. The Birmingham, there's a big, I just saw Sama Yaku, it was a big thing. Yeah. Leave that which your forefathers are commanding you to do. And then he said, and he commanded us to prayer, and he commanded us to truth, chastity, and he commanded us to joining ties. And I just want to touch on that topic, the joining ties. Because we live right now in, in, the, in arguably the most hyper-connected society that humanity has ever had. Right? Because we, we live in the age of social media, where everybody's connected, but nobody's actually connected. And it's the craziest thing is, we're, we're all connected via social media, but we have, like in, in England alone, we have, in the Western world, we have a loneliness problem. A loneliness. 20%, I think, of people in London complain of severe loneliness. In Japan, they've got this problem where the old people commit crimes on purpose so they can go to prison to talk to somebody. That's, that's insane. <coughs> And, and, and what does this, this social media do? It's, it's just, it's just, it's all grandstanding. It's people online who don't care about you, faceless, you don't, you can't, you don't care about the person on the other side, and you're just pretending to be a personality that you're not, with no care about what it's doing to your soul. And it fills people, because all you do then is in order to get reactions from people online, you say things you don't really mean, and you exhibit emotions you don't really have, and then suddenly all you do spark fires that shouldn't be there, fueling flames that shouldn't exist. And suddenly you have this massive problem we have in our world, the, the, the society is bipolar, you're either with us or against us. You're either left or you're right. Everything's just inflamed. And who knows what it will take for the flames to actually erupt in their true form. And like the Quran speaks about, uh, that the disbelievers, they have a rage, a rage of ignorance inside their hearts. And that's why when the man came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Abu Hurairah says, and the Rajal قال للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم, O senior, a man came to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, advise me. And the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تغضب, do not become angry. Do not become angry. Farada the Mirani, there's a what kind of advice? Oh, Sini, give me proper advice. And what did the Prophet ﷺ say again? La taqdab, don't get angry. He's getting angry just asking the question. He's saying, don't get angry. Don't get angry. We have this, you know, you see something, you don't have the time to think, click, retweet. Like, this is not me saying it. Jonathan Haidt, one of the most famous social psychologists in the world, he's, he's written books on this. And I read his piece. He's got this amazing piece in the Atlantic. I sent it to you. you should, everybody should read it. It's very good. Where he says that literally, you don't even have, you don't have time to think and you've already retweeted whatever you were going to retweet. With no consequence. What did the Prophet to say to Sayyidina Mu'ad? Will people not be thrown on their faces in the hellfire except by the harvest of their tongues? When Sayyidina Mu'ad then said, you know, he said, will we be, will we be, Will we be uh, um, taken to account for that, those actions that our tongues did? And the Prophet said, well, you will face first in the hellfire for the harvest of their tongues. And so we have this loneliness problem. People are not connected. People are fake connections. Artificial, that in an instant, marriages break. We have divorce rates, crazy amount of divorce rates. Just families broken apart in an instant. Fragile connections. And... Um, and then we have another problem, again, linked to the modernity and the social media age, is the massive problem we have of just the nafs. Everything is done for the ego, continuously satiating an ego, the lower self, again and again. Every Netflix, their fast food, microwave meals, everything's happening fast. Al-Ujilatu min shaytan the Prophet ﷺ said, quickness is from the devil. To do things without thinking, that's a devilish uh, character trait to have. And that's what we have in the modern age. Everything's, and then you have, uh, you know, the, as Slavoj Žižek, he calls it the totalitarian state, totalitarian state of gratification. That you just need to gratify yourself as much as possible. You need to watch everything you can, you know, unlimited viewing, Netflix, YouTube algorithm, next, 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 you realize seven hours have gone and you've just been watching cat videos or whatever. Non-stop, continuously. Instagram, you're flicking up, 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 up. And you guys don't think that there's, there's psychologists working on these systems. They found studies to show that the effect social media has on you, and you have withdrawal symptoms like somebody who's addicted to crack cocaine. And we have our children addicted to these things. 
Allah I know what this is doing to their souls. Because modernity, I mean the psychologists talk about the psychology, but Allah knows what's done to their souls, the fitrah of the, that the Prophet ﷺ came to revive. And, and the Prophet Wasallam, and this is another, you know the Prophet Wasallam, one of his great gifts, he was the great unifier Wasallam. In broken societies, he would bring broken societies together Wasallam. He would never hurt people, he would never say no. Sayyidina Anna said he never said no to anybody. Even if he had nothing to give, he would just say a kind word. Or he'd borrow money. The Prophet would borrow money just so he could give somebody and make somebody smile. The Prophet brought hearts together. Allah brings hearts together. You could spend everything on the, on the earth, you're not going to bring the hearts together. Only Allah, you know, they came out, what is it? Um, Theresa May said, oh, we're going to spend 50 million to bring, uh, you know, these disenfranchised communities to love the Tories. Alhamdulillah, it hasn't worked. Or love, or love, I don't know, whatever. Right? Remember the bounty of Allah when you were enemies and Allah joined your hearts. And you were on the edge of the pits of the hellfire and Allah pulled you back. And the Prophet when he went to Medina, Imam al-Ghazali, I think, says that one of the, if, the, if there was no miracle of the Prophet except that he brought the Aus and Khazraj together, that would be enough as a miracle. They used to go to war over camel races. My camel beat your camel, let's go to war. I'm not, this is real. Yawm Bu'ath. They literally had a war before the Prophet came. Where the Jews in, in instigated, or Medina instigated a bit, and then the, they went to war, and they got so troubled by the war that they realized they had to do something to bring society together. And they were going to put Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul as their leader, and then they called the Prophet وسلم, from Makkah al Mukarramah and say that Aisha said it was as if the war of Wa'ath was made for the Prophet because he brought hearts together. And that's why when, when the, there's an incident in Ghazwa Bani Mustalaq, when the Muhajirin and the Ansar, one of the Muwali from the Muhajirin, you know, one of the, the free slaves on the Muhajirin, he kicked one of the Ansar by accident. And the Ansar, he screams, Ya Lal Ansar! Oh Ansar, come! How dare he kick me? Or whatever. You know, like gang, you know, my boys need to come back to me, or whatever. And then the, the Muhajirin, Ya Lal Muhajirin! And the Muhajirin are getting up, and it's all about to kick off, like literally on the verge of, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they saw the vein of anger throb. He used to, when he used to get angry, the vein used to throb in his forehead, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he comes down and says, Abi jahiliya wa ana al-hurikum. You call to slogans of ignorance and I'm here in front of you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he would join the hearts of people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's why he narrates a beautiful hadith. Uh, Sayyidina Anas, and it's one of my favorite hadith. He says that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to me once, and the way the Prophet ﷺ used to love Sayyidina Anas, Khadim Rasulullah, the servant of the Messenger of Allah, Imam al nawawi in the Arba'in, Khadim Rasulullah, the, the, the servant of the Messenger of Allah Wasallam. Ten years he served the Prophet Wasallam. He said the Prophet ﷺ never told me off once, never hit me nothing. And the, we could talk about Sayyidina Anas, but we're not going to. But Sayyidina Anas ﷺ says, once the Prophet ﷺ came, he grabbed my hand, he said, Ya Bunaya, oh my son, if you can go to sleep at night without hatred for anybody in your heart, then do so. Because whosoever does this, then he has revived my sunnah. And whoever revives my sunnah, then he loves me. And whosoever loves me will be with me in paradise. And he's saying, what, what, what else do you want? When Qatada ibn Nu'man, عنه, when his students came to him and said, Ya, ya Qatada, give us something that will make our hearts yearn for paradise. And he said, Fiha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, in it is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And now we have Muslims going around attacking Muslims over, over issues that have been argued over for centuries by legitimate jurists which you have no place in interfering in. Like the concept of the Mawlid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. People arguing about the validity of the Mawlid of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You, you don't have to do the mawlid, nobody has to do the mawlid, but you have to recognize the fact that Nawawi, Imam Nawawi, Imam Suyuti, Ibn Hajar, Ibn Hajar al Haythami, the great scholars of this ummah permitted the mawlid. And there were great scholars who said it wasn't allowed, like Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, and Imam al Shatibi rahimahullah, and, and especially the Maliki scholars, very strict on the concept of bid'ah. And there were great scholars who said both sides. 
Like Imam Shafi'i said, I had a debate once with one of the scholars and things got heated. And at the end of him, when it looked like it was really going to get tough, I said to him, are we not brothers? Are we, at the end of the day, are we not brothers in Islam? You don't have to do what I do and you, I don't have to do what you do. But can we not agree that we are brothers from the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we all have our own ways of celebrating the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then, and, and there's much more to be said about that, but I will, I will move on. And then he says, then now Heraclius now gives his analysis. And he says, I asked about his lineage. And you told me that his lineage was of somebody of high lineage. And he says, every prophet is sent from the best lineage of his people. And I said, has anyone before him said something like this? And you said, no. And then I say to that, that if anybody had said this before him, we would have just said, he's a guy just, he's jumping on the coattails of somebody else. He's just taking statements other people have said and just make, trying to make them his own. I asked you, were any of his father's kings? You said, no. If you had said yes, I would have said he's a man just seeking the leadership that his fathers used to have before him. I asked you, have you ever accused him of lying? And you said no. And then I know that a prophet will never lie to the people. He will never lie about Allah Jalla fil Ula. I asked you, who follows him? The nobility, the elite of a community, or is it the weak? And you said it was the weak. And I, he said, this way he said, the weak are always ittiba'ul rasul. The followers of the prophets are always the weak and the disenfranchised people. Like the, the hadith of the Prophet Inna Allah ma'a munkasaratil quloob. Allah is with the brokenhearted. Allah is with the brokenhearted. And so he says, are the, are the followers increasing or decreasing? You said they're increasing. He said that's the nature of faith until it completes itself. It would continuously increase in number. I asked you, do, this is, I really want to focus on this. He says, I asked you, does anybody from his faith leave his faith after having entered it? And you said, no. He says, this is the nature of faith. When it enters the core of the heart, it can never leave. And this is from what I take from this. You know, and in another narration, he says, whoever tastes the delight of the sweetness of Iman, Halawatul Iman, he can never leave the faith after that. That anybody who says they left Islam because they didn't like Islam, or because Islam was, was, was spiritually unsatisfying for them, or they find Islam to be barbaric, or whatever reason they apostatize from the faith of Islam was never really a Muslim in the first place. Or never truly tasted what Iman really meant. They created a caricature of the faith. They created a caricature of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They created an idea of what the Quran was saying with no idea what the Quran was actually saying. Then they built this straw man and then they got their axe and they started smashing the straw man down while the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam over there. Like the Muslim, when Umm Jameel, the wife of Abu Lahab, came to the Prophet ﷺ at the Kaaba, and the Prophet ﷺ was sitting with Abu Bakr, and she picked up stones to chuck at the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ sitting there, and Abu Bakr suddenly, suddenly Umm Jameel comes, and uh, she says to Abu Jahl, uh, Abu Bakr, sorry, she says, Aina sahibu, where's your companion? And Abu Bakr says, he was right next to me. But I realized that Allah had blinded her from him, ﷺ. So I just stayed quiet, and I was like, I don't know. And she went, and as she's walking off, she's reciting poetry. And I can't remember the lines of poetry, but she says one line, they call him Muhammad, but he's Muthamman. Astaghfirullah. She says they call him the one who's oft praised, but we say he's the one who's oft cursed. And when they brought those words to the Prophet you know what he said? And they used to call him Muthamman. So instead of Muhammad, they would twist it and they'd call him Muthamman. The one who's oft cursed rather than the one who's oft praised. And you know what the Prophet said about that? He said, all praise is due to Allah who has removed their curses from me. Because they're cursing Muthammam wa ana Muhammad. They're cursing Muthammam and I'm Muhammad. <laughs> so they're talking about some other guy called Muthammam. Poor guy's getting blasted. I don't know who he is. He hasn't even done anything. But I'm Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they've done nothing. Because how can you, who, who, who do you think you are to denigrate the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? You're nobody. You can do nothing to destroy the, the honor and the sanctity of Sayyidina Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because Allah, Allah has elevated his rank. Who, what are you going to do? And that's the nature of the apostate. There's an actual, it's like an archetype, the apostate. What does he do? I'll give you an example. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'id, la'natullah alayhi, one of the most horrific enemies of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He used to come back from trade caravans, he used to host meals in his house. 
He used to invite people. Arabs were very hospitable people. These are from their good character traits. And I assume they still are. I don't know many Arabs. But I'm assuming they're very, very nice people. And so what happens is, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'id, he invited the Prophet ﷺ once. He goes, come to my house and eat. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you don't possibly die. Every opportunity is an opportunity to call to Islam. He goes, Uqba, I can't come until you, uh, until, and tashhad an la ilaha illallah wa anya rasulullah. I can't come until you say that there's no God except Allah and that you accept that I am the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Uqba is there like, oh, come on, just come and eat. <laughs> you know, like, I don't, no, he's like, no, no, you have, to, you have to accept Islam or I'm not going to come to your house and eat. And then Uqba says, okay, I accept that there is no God except Allah and I accept that you're the messenger of Allah. And the Prophet sallallahu went to his house and ate. Uqba is best friends with Abu Jahl la'anatullah alayhi. The next day Abu Jahl comes up to him and goes, Uqba, I heard you become Muslim. He goes, ah, nah, nah, I'm not Muslim. I just said it, you know, because I wanted him to come to eat at my house. And he wasn't coming, so I said these things. I made him happy. He came to my house to eat. That was it. Abu Jahl's like, yeah. Well, if you really didn't say, I want you to spit in the face of Muhammad sallallahu and to step on his neck when he prays. The nature of the apostate is, he leaves Islam because of an inferiority complex. And partly, who's responsible for that? The modern media machine. Telling him that Islam is horrific. Telling him that women who are in niqaba are letterboxes and bank robbers. And telling him that the problem with the Muslim world is Islam. That's part of the problem. And that's, but, but at the end, the great responsibility of leaving the faith doesn't lie with Boris Johnson or the Sun or the news of the world. It lies with the person because everybody is autonomous and you get to make your own decisions. You, you are what you are. Right? So that's the point. But the nature of the apostate is he always needs to prove himself that Islam was actually really bad. Trust me, trust me, it was really bad. I need to show. And he'll overcompensate in every single thing he does to try to prove that, you know, I'm, I was right for leaving it. Trust me, guys. Yeah, you know, it's really bad. And so Uqba comes and la'natullah, he spits in the face of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And while the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says that he steps on the back of his neck. And he's the same man when they found the dead camel in the streets of Mecca and Abu Jahl said, who will have the nerve to put it on the back of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while he prays? Uqba ibn Abi Mu'id picked that up and he placed it on the back of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And say the Fatima comes and takes it off. And then the Prophet made the great bad dua. And I mentioned this because this is the majesty of the Prophet. You know, Prophet was nice. He was, he was amazing. His character was beautiful. But when Sayyid Aisha says, when the haq, Ida tu'uddiya haq, lam yakun shay'un li ghadabihi. When the truth of Islam was at risk, nothing could stem the anger of the Messenger of Allah. Nothing. And the Prophet raises the hands and he says, that, you know, Ya Uqba ibn Abi Mu'id, that, La ulqiqa kharij al Makkah, I will not meet you outside of Makkah Mukarrama, illa an alauta ra'saka min unuqiqa bis safe, except I will remove your head from your shoulders with a sword. My Messenger وسلم, said that, your Prophet وسلم, said that to Uqba ibn Abi Mu'id. When Badr came, Uqba didn't have the nerve to leave Makkah. He was terrified. He knew, they all knew. He didn't want to go. He goes, oh, ah, yeah, Ya Abu Jahl, he told me I'm gonna, he's gonna kill me himself. Abu Jahl's like, no, no, what you do here? You take a really fast camel, a really fast horse. If the going gets, to, Abu Jahl gets killed himself, but he's giving all this hype, and he's saying, look, you jump on the carros. When the going gets tough, you ride off as quick as you can. You get back to Makkah. Allah Allah, things will be rosy. It's gonna be fine. Don't worry about it. Uqba's like, safe. I'm gonna do that. So he takes this nice, oh, he takes this horse. He goes to, he goes to Badr. When he gets to Badr, the horse doesn't run. <laughs> now he's stuck. And then the Prophet ﷺ, they capture Uqba ibn Abi Mu'id. The Muslims win the battle, it's a famous story, Badr. When they capture Uqba ibn Abi Mu'id, he's like, Ya Muhammad. The Prophet ﷺ says, Give me the sunnah. And he says, he says about Uqba ibn Abi Mu'id. Oh, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'id starts, he's, he's, he's terrified now. he's screaming, he's like, Ya Muhammad, Amama ulai, Amama haulai nas, are you going to kill me in front of my own tribe? Have some, come on, don't, you can't, that's not nice, or whatever. He's like, come on, don't do that. He's trying to scream for sympathy and mercy. But remember, you don't attack the, if you, the, say that Aisha said, La yudizis sayya bi sayya, la ya yantaqimu li nafsi. The Prophet ﷺ would never take revenge for himself. When the Bedouin came and he pulled the cloak of the Prophet ﷺ and he left marks on the necks of the neck of the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Ya Muhammad, give me money. He said, Ya Muhammad, give me money. Laysa maluk wala mala abig. It's not your money, it's not your dad's money. He came, he came to the Prophet, he said this, he said this to the Prophet ﷺ and he's pulling on the cloak and then Sayyidina Umar comes forward, he goes, Da'ni an udruba an adrib anaka hadha al munafiq. Ya Rasul, give me permission. Just give me, give me the word, Ya Rasulullah, I'll take care of him. And the Prophet ﷺ starts smiling, he goes, ah. 
yeah, Badu, you know, Bedouin, do you think I'm gonna do you think I'm gonna do horrible things to you? Do you, do you know what I could do to you? He goes, Yeah, Muhammad, we all know you, you never return a wrong with a wrong. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet, you're right. Give him whatever he wants. When Uqba comes now, he's like, Ya Muhammad, how are you in front? And then and then Uqba screams, he tries the the oldest trick in the book. He goes, Ya Muhammad, man less subyan. Ya Muhammad, who's gonna look after the children? <laughs> I got kids, yeah. I got kids. Who's gonna look after the kids? What about the children? And then the Prophet gave an answer that only the Messenger of Allah could give when he said, Annar, the fire will take care of your children. And he took the sword and he took the head of Allah. Remember, he will never take revenge for himself. But if you attack the sanctity of Islam, the sanctity of Allah Jalla fil Ula, you attack the sanctity of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was nothing that could quell the anger that the Prophet would have. Nothing. And so he removed the head of Uqba ibn Abi Ma'id from his shoulders. Right? And then we can talk about hypocrisy. But I just wanted to make that point, the overcompensation that every, every apostate and ex-Muslim will do. Because they never, they, they're not happy with what they let, you know, they're not happy. And so they try to prove it. To, they're trying to prove it to themselves. Trust me, it's really bad. Don't trust me. We did the right thing. Fajr was hard, man. <laughs> that was really tough. You know, Fajr and all this and hijab and all. I couldn't do it. Like, a lie. This is this is what happens to them. And then he says, um, did, "I asked you, has he ever betrayed his word?" And he said, "No." And he says, that's the prophets, they never betrayed their word. And I asked you, what does he command to? And he said, he commands to worship Allah alone and not to associate partners with him. And to, um, and not to worship idols and to pray and for, and for, and for truthfulness and chastity. And then, then Her- Heraclius said, if what you say is true, then he will take ownership of the land under my feet. And they did take ownership of the land under the feet of the, the, the Caesar. And then he says other stuff, and we won't go into that. I'll actually come to a close now. <laughs> Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kana mazahan fil bayt. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was always joking around in the house sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When they would describe the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they would say, one of the names of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Imam Masuti mentions, that he was Abu Haq. He was always smiling sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Always in a good mood sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a prophet of hope. And he, he gave nobody more hope than he gave to the um, his ummah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's why when he was about to pass away and he was crying to Allah, jalla fil ula, about the state of his ummah, Sayyidina Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when Jibreel, alayhi salam, came to him and said, Ya Muhammad, Allah is asking, what is it that you want? And he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ummati, what about, what's going to happen to my ummah after I go? And then Jibreel, alayhi salam, said, Allah says, نَرْضِيكَ فِي أُمَّتِكَ وَلَا نَسُوءُكَ We will make you happy with regards to your ummah. And we will never, we will never hurt you in regards to your ummah. And that's why Allah says in the Quran, وَنَسَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى That soon, we will definitely give to you so much that you will become content. And Imam Al-Qurtubi mentions that the contentment here is what? Because nothing will make the Prophet Sallallahu content as long as one member of his ummah still resides in the fire of hell. Nothing will make the Prophet ﷺ content until that's going on. And that's why Imam al qurtubi mentions about that verse, that Allah will let him take every single member out from the hell fire until Allah will finally say to Sayyidina Muhammad ﷺ, Hal raditu ya Muhammad, now are you happy? And then the Prophet ﷺ says, raditu ya Now I'm happy. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet ﷺ narrates in a hadith that the day started and a group of people went to work. They were the Bani Israel, the Jews. And Allah gave them the Torah and He said, work. Until midday came in. And then it was time for them to go home. So Allah goes, here, take one qirat, and the qirat is a measurement. Take one qirat each and off you go home. And then another group came to work. And they were the Christians. And Allah gave them the Injil and He said, now you work. And when he came time for them to go home, he said, now you go home, here's one qirat. And then came the last group of workers. The Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad came. 
and they will work until the end of times. We are the Ummah of Asr. Asr Khusr. Why is Asr mentioned for us? Because Asr is the last prayer before the day ends. We are the last bastions of the truth of Islam. We have a great responsibility on our shoulders. Humanity, this is not an exaggeration to say this, humanity depends on us to bring them the message of Islam, to show them Muhammad and not Mudhammad. Because when you show horrible character traits, you're not coming to them as Muhammad, you come to them as Mudhammad. And Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib said that whosoever would see the Prophet ﷺ suddenly would just be like, wow. وَمَنْ خَالَطَهُ مَعْرِفَةً أَحَبَّهُ And whosoever would spend time with the Prophet ﷺ, getting to know him, fall in love with him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have a great response. Many people, Habib ibn Zayd, I just mentioned one story. Habib ibn Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when Musaylimatul Kadhaab came, announced his false prophethood. He said, I am a prophet after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Habib ibn Zayd, his ambassador to the false prophet. When Habib ibn Zayd got to Musaylamatul Kadhaab, Musaylama said, show me the letter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, min Muhammad Rasul ila ila Musaylamatul Kadhaab. And the letter read, and then he said to Habib ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu an Ansari, one of the Ansari sahaba, he said, Habib ibn Zayd, he said, do you accept that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah? Muhammad Rasulullah? He said, yes, of course, I submit that the Muhammad وسلم, is the messenger of Allah. Then he said, do you, do you testify that I'm the messenger of Allah? And Habib ibn Zayd goes, I, I can't hear you. <laughs> Literally, he goes, oh, I can't hear you. He said something, I don't know what it was. But he, he says, really? And then he cuts a bit of his flesh from his body. And then he says again, do you testify that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah? He says, yes. He says, do you testify that I'm the messenger of Allah? He says, I can't hear you. <laughs> and he cuts my flesh from his body. And it keeps happening until Habib ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu gets martyred in the way in defense of the honor of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Sa'ad ibn Abi Rabi radiallahu anhu in Uhud, when the Prophet وسلم, said, go find Sa'ad, my companion Sa'ad, I don't know where he is. And they, looked, they said, we looked in the living, we couldn't find him. We went into the battlefield amongst the corpses, and we find him breathing his last. And he went up to Sa'ad ibn Rabi radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the companion, and he said, the Prophet is looking for you. He says, Iqra minni ala nabi salam. Send salam upon the Prophet وسلم, from me. And, and, and tell him that I, I have asked Allah to give the greatest, that may Allah give him the greatest reward he has ever given to any Prophet. And tell the Ansar that if the Prophet is so much as harmed and one of their eyes still blinks, Sa'ad ibn Rabi will ask them on the Day of Judgment. The honor of the Prophet this great hope in this great age of modernity and anxiety we live in, it now lies on our shoulders. And we have to take responsibility for the for carrying the message of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and I leave you with one final statement. There's a few a few more things to say, but I'll finish with this. Iqbal, everybody loves a bit of Anam Iqbal. Well, I love it. He has this beautiful statement. He was a great philosopher and thinker of Islam, and he said that I looked I looked into the world, and they asked me, Iqbal, what do you see as the problem with the world? He said, I looked into the great problems of the world and I came to the conclusion that the world is full of love, but it has no beloved. And the world is thirsting for the drink of Sayyidina Muhammad and has his ummah and as the last bastions of Islam, it is now our responsibility to make sure the thirst of humanity is quenched. And Sayyid Abu Hassan al Nabi mentions one of the most beautiful statements. He says that Badr, the Prophet ﷺ, raised his hands. He said, In tuhlik hadihi al-usba la tu'abad fil ard. That if this small group is defeated, Ya Allah, you will not be worshipped on the face of this earth. Our existence is only to maintain the worship of Allah on the face of this earth. That's all we exist for, nothing more, nothing less. And when we fail in our duties to continue that maintenance of the worship of Allah on the earth, then there is no need for our existence. Like the Prophet said, the, the world will not end as long as there is a man on the face of it. Qala la ilaha illallah who says la ilaha illallah. When he goes, the world is in, of no use whatsoever. Allah will never punish them, Muhammad وسلم, as long as you are amongst them. As long as we keep the Prophet وسلم, alive, the punishment of Allah will stay far from us. 
I pray that Allah Jalla Fil makes us worthy recipients and carriers of the message of, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah brings us to a state where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is pleased with. And like Allah has gathered us here today, we ask that he gathers us under the banner of Liwa'ul Hamd, the banner of praise held by the one who is of praise Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the Day of Judgment. So I'm sorry for going over time. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik wa nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nasta'afiru wa natu'afiru.